Good morning, everybody. Hope you are all doing well. Um, my name is Travis Terry, and I have the privilege of serving as the president of Capolino. I want to thank and welcome our audience today to kick off Capolino's Future of New York series, featuring my very good friend, and to me, one of the most impressive visionaries in the region, Tom Wright, who is the president and CEO of the Regional Plan Association. Also, if I could just take a uh, moderator's uh, privilege for a second, I do wanna say hello to uh, two very special people in the audience, my two parents, Howard and Gay Terry. Hi, mom and dad, uh, thanks for joining. Uh, as you may have heard a few weeks ago, Capolino announced the rebranding and expansion of our firm. Uh, and I wanna congratulate uh, the entire Capolino team for all of their efforts. Uh, we are no longer just a lobbying firm. Uh, the Capolino team is now laser focused on ensuring our clients achieve sustainable success in the New York region by complementing our lobbying with an expertise in finance, real estate, social impact, sustainability, and strategic planning. To do that, we've always wanted to listen and learn from experts, clients, and friends about how to move our city and our region forward and that is the essential reason why we decided to start this Future of New York series. Now, before we get started, let me just cut to the chase. New York will be back. Uh, there is no question about that. Do not listen to the naysayers. Um, we will be back. Uh, when and how we come back, however, is really the question that we're gonna be exploring today with Tom. Um, I just want to say that uh, I, I have the privilege of serving on the Regional Plan Association Board, and I can't express how impressed I am with Tom's leadership or the work that RPA does. For nearly 100 years, RPA has developed and promoted ideas to improve the economic health, environmental resiliency, and quality of life of the New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut metropolitan areas. RPA is also known uh, for its data-driven research and advocacy. Yes, we do believe in data and facts. Um, and most are probably know about two of RPA's major events. The first being the regional plans of which they've released four in the last hundred of years or so. And uh, as an urban planning nerd, I just strongly recommend everybody read those because they play a really important role in uh, New York City history. Um, also, these plans have been responsible for some of the most important advances in our region that allow us to grow. Proposed ideas like moving the Was George Washington Bridge from Midtown to Uptown, the Palisades Interstate Park System, the MTA, the, Met the Manhattan Bike Plan, some of the early studies on racial discrimination and fair housing, the High Line, Long Island Railroad, Third Track, Second Avenue Subway, and Eastside Access and congestion pricing. I could go on and on and on, but we only have about an hour today. RPA is also well known for its annual assembly where we gather the greatest urban planning minds in the world to discuss complicated policy and hear a keynote from a world leader. In fact, only a few years ago, we welcomed our new president-elect Joe Biden as our speaker. Uh, and I have to admit, as it relates to the future of the city, and we'll get into this today, nothing feels better than saying president-elect Joe Biden. Our guest today, uh, Tom Wright, has been president and CEO of the Regional Plan Association since 2015. He's also the chairman of the New Jersey State Planning Commission and a visiting lecturer at the Columbia University Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation. Tom, it is such an honor to be with you today and I thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me and the audience. Um, we will start our presentation on with uh, Tom focusing on New York's next comeback. And then I will be asking him a couple questions followed by questions from the audience. If you have any questions, please post them in the question and answer room that is a button that is right at the bottom of your screen. Uh, Tom and my talk will be about 40 minutes. So we hope to save the last 20 minutes for audience questions. Tom, thank you again. The floor is yours. Thanks, Travis. Thank you for that very kind, overly generous introduction. And I'll say before I start the presentation, it's just a real pleasure to work with you. Congratulations on being the president of Capolino and working with you and everybody at the firm has been a great pleasure for, for several years now. And, I, and before I give this presentation, I feel like I should say I get to be the beneficiary of extraordinary work of the talented, creative, 
um, brilliant and dedicated team at Regional Plan Association, both the staff and the board members. Um, people ask me often kind of what this, you know, the, uh, the secret sauce is at RPA. And it's not just the, the, the talented staff who do the research and planning. We are a fact-based organization. Um, but also our board, which really rolls up their sleeves, gets involved, um, has, has many of the greatest experts, former public officials who help us um, create the plans and policies and recommendations that we do. So I'm gonna switch to share screen now, and I hope that this will come up. What I'm gonna do is just kind of very quickly overview our most recent report from a couple of weeks ago called New York's Next Comeback really to try and sift through kind of the fact and fiction and point out what are the, the trends that we think people should be paying attention to and some recommendations for the recovery that we expect to you know, launch fairly soon. First, just to quickly kind of reiterate some of the things that you were talking about so folks know, RPA is a nonprofit research planning and advocacy organization. We've been around since 1922. Um, we're a private nonprofit, so we have our, our recommendations and plans have absolutely zero weight of law, but we have this history and tradition of looking at this entire tri-state um, metropolitan area, essentially northern New Jersey, southwestern Connecticut, all of Long Island, the lower Hudson Valley, centered around New York City. And I like to point out to people that there are 783 towns and cities and municipalities in this region. One of them is New York City and it's eight and a half million people and 782 are not. And that that's part of what we bring to the table is a kind of NGO perspective to think across the, the, the political boundaries, think across the silos of transportation, land use, environment, energy, housing, et cetera, and try and create a long range vision. As you mentioned, we have in our 100 year history created four landmark plans for the region, which identified um, kind of what are the long-term trends that we need to think about, not over a four year political increment, but 10, 15, 20, 25 years out. What are the investments, the policies, the things that we're gonna need? And each of them, each of the, the three plans in the last century really helped shape um, the metropolitan region and its growth and prosperity and, uh, and equity. And we hope the fourth plan that we released um, just three years ago will be doing the same. I have to admit when I talk about these plans, for all of the work that we did in the fourth plan, five years worth of public outreach, research, uh, polling, surveys, um, partnering with civic groups, we did not anticipate COVID-19 and the pandemic. And so this has forced us to, re, to, to take a fresh look at what we're doing and talking about. Um, and so we decided to put out um, earlier this fall, this report on the comeback. And, and the goal of this was there were a couple things that we wanted to address. First was really to correct the misinformation. I mean, I think one of the real tragedies of this um, situation that we found ourselves in, and of course this ties into the national conversation and polarization that we have right now, but that there's just an enormous amount of misinformation. And of course, we're not always working with perfect information, but making sure that people understand what's really happening versus anecdotally what might, they might be hearing was really important. We also thought that it was critical to put this crisis in an historical and global perspective um, because we know that, first of all, New York, those of us who have been around for the last 20 years, we have come back after 9-11, after Superstorm Sandy, after the financial crisis. And so we have a history of resiliency and recovery here in our region. Um, but what's happening here for the first time is really truly a global crisis. And we have to keep that in mind. Also understand that what's happening in the city is also, it's, it's a regional context that we need to think about. Some of the best responses, most important work that's been done has been recognizing that. I think in particular, the way the governors of the three states and entire, indeed the entire Northeast have coordinated efforts has been moving in the right direction and recognizing um, that this is not uh, just a kind of city phenomenon, but something happening to the entire region, nation, world again. 
Finally, we wanted to create a narrative that focused not uh, that focused on how we were going to recover rather than whether we were going to recover. And I think in some of the kind of doomsday scenarios, people talk about, well, urbanism, people will never come back together again. They'll never get back on the trains or buses or other things. They'll never work in the office again. Things are certainly going to change. And, and this has accelerated the changes that we've seen. But um, uh, we, we, we still know that, that we are going to recover and we need to focus on how that happens. And so we wanted to set the stage for, for, for future recommendations along those lines. The first thing I just wanna point out that we came up with in this report was kind of recognizing that there are common mistakes that people are making that need to be avoided. Um, I think the first one is mistaking short-term disruptions for new paradigms. The way we think about what happened with COVID was there were certain trends, things that were already starting to happen, remote working, uh, telemedicine, other things that technology was enabling that have probably been, uh, not probably, definitely been accelerated by this. Other things um, kind of went through, you know, a reversal or, or stopped things in their tracks. Not all of these are new paradigm shifts. Um, certain types of things, including, I believe, human interaction, face-to-face -face interaction, are going to come back. And so we shouldn't be thinking that everything that's happening on a short term is some new paradigm. Also, we need to understand that the city and suburbs um, do not create a kind of zero-sum game. And I'm, I'm old enough to remember Back in the 80s, those of us who might recall the famous Ed Koch um, advertisements of him blocking up the Holland Tunnel to, 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 to keep businesses from moving um, to New Jersey. You know, back in the 70s and 80s, we kind of, there was this sense that the city and suburbs were in competition with each other and what was good for one was bad for the other or vice versa. I think over the last 20, 25 years, we started to recognize uh, that that wasn't the case and that in fact, what was good for the city was good for the surrounding communities or what was good for what was happening say in, in Westchester or Long Island was also good for New York City. But we started to see as COVID spread, some of that old thinking creep back into the way people talked about things. So we wanna, we wanna really highlight the fact um, that it's not a zero sum game uh, and that we are either going to rise and survive together or all suffer together. And so we need to be thinking of this from in a regional context. Another mistake would be to assume that a rising tide would lift all boats. Um, the impacts of COVID-19, and I'll show some, some charts to show this, have been wildly disparate. Certain industries like hospitality and restaurants and other things have been devastated by this while others have largely emerged unscathed. Um, likewise, in the recovery, we can't just assume that everybody will come back at the same level. And in fact, it's going to take intentional policies and thoughtful uh, um, uh, leadership to really make sure that the communities, the industries, the individuals that have been hardest hit by this do lead in the recovery. And the final mistake I wanna point out would be kind of thinking about how we get back to where we were say a year ago, or back last January, instead of envisioning uh, a new future. One of the lessons we've learned from again, 9-11, um, Superstorm Sandy, all of the tragedies we've had in the past is that New York and the region always have reemerged, have recovered, but never to what they were before. These are catalytic events that will transform the industry, so uh, transform the region. So the industries that are going to lead the recovery, the way we come back will be different from what we had before. And it would be a mistake to just try and go back to where we were in 2018, 2019. Instead, we have to understand how things are going to change and envision a new future that's better for us. Just some charts, uh, since we like data here at RPA and maps, of course, and you can see, uh, uh, to, to kind of highlight one of these. I mean, one of the myths that we saw early on was this assumption that urban density equaled higher spread of coronavirus. That's not the case. These two maps, on the left, what you see is the residential population density in New York. 
And if density spread the virus, then you would expect um, COVID races to follow that map. Instead, they're quite different. And this, uh, anywhere you collect data in metropolitan regions, we've seen this borne out in other places too. It is not about residential density um, that is a kind of parallel for spread of coronavirus. Instead, it's about activities, um, certain industries. Um, there are a lot of other, other factors that are just more important in this, uh, to this than, um, than, 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 than residential density. So we shouldn't think that those, those are, a pair, um, are, are equal. Another thing everybody's concerned about and talking about quite a lot is transit ridership. Um, and you can see this is a chart going back uh, to March and the red line is daily COVID cases, which of course spiked in the early spring, uh, were flat for a long time through the summer and, and tragically are starting to come back um, now. You can then also see in the dark and light blue lines, you see subway and bus ridership and what happened with them. The key point here that I wanna try and make is that transit ridership appears to be safe even during COVID. And there is not a one-to-one -one relationship between riding transit um, uh, and the spread of the virus. Um, data regionally uh, from around the world and the region um, argues that there is in fact little relationship between the spread of COVID and transit ridership. And in particular in global cities where they are doing contact tracing much more so than we are here in the US, mass transit ridership has not emerged as a factor indicative of the ride, uh, of, of the rise of COVID. Um, even now as cases are rising, we are hearing more about that being as the result of social gatherings and other kinds of behavior rather than transit ridership. This depends of course on people following safety precautions, wearing masks, staying distant, um, washing their hands, et cetera. And we need to keep monitoring this relationship. But for now, the trains and buses in New York and the region are cleaner than they've ever been. The air in our subway cars is being filtered almost at twice the rate that the CDC uh, says is required to keep it safe. And people have been largely following guidelines. Um, so under these conditions, mass transit ridership appears to be very safe and we should not encourage people to shun transit for private automobiles. Um, it has, uh, driving has a host of public safety and health problems associated with it. And indeed, we're gonna need people to return to transit to keep the agencies afloat financially, since of course here we pay a higher, per, uh, riders pay a higher percentage of the operating costs of transit than they do in virtually any other part of the country. So, so it's really important to understand this relationship and push back against, again, I would call it the false narrative that riding transit is not safe. Another relationship I, I just wanna kind of point out that people are talking about is what's going to happen you know, in the future with working from home and how are things gonna change? First off, what, what I wanna kind of point out is that in different industries in each of these circles represents um, a different industry. The size of the circle represents its, its uh, relative size uh, in terms of employment. And you can see kind of where it is on the vertical axis is in terms of the average annual earnings. And then on the horizontal axis, it's the percent of people in that industry with the ability to telework, to work remotely. And so of course, what we see are industries on the right, like education and finance, people can work remotely. I teach at Columbia and I've been doing it by Zoom uh, this fall and that's working actually quite well. Um, folks, of course, in food services and retail and others don't have that kind of option. Um, we know that, 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 that post-COVID travel uh, behavior and, and working in offices is going to change. But I think the key thing here is to realize is that roughly half of the employment in, in Manhattan today or pre-COVID was in industries where that wasn't an option anyway. So thinking that suddenly we're gonna empty out the city um, uh, with employment is just not the case. Even in the ones where it is an option, there are obvious benefits to face-to-face -to -face interaction. Uh, younger workers in particular, 
are, 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 are kind of indicating that they need that kind of face-to-face -face interaction um, in their careers. In certain types of industries, we are, we are seeing it uh, more pronounced. My expectation and our expectation is at RPA that it's going to be a more nuanced picture, that there might be more flexibility in the system, that there may be some more teleworking or satellite offices or things, but that certain types of activities and industries are still going to rely on um, the diversity uh, uh, of interactions, the ability to connect with a large number of people very effectively and efficiently and quickly and that we are going to see a lot of that return. And so I think it's it, it's just wrong to assume that kind of um, we're going to stay the way that we've been interacting uh, for the past year. The impacts of this are gonna be unclear and we're gonna to have to see how it plays out. But I think anybody who tells you that we're going to stay with what we've been doing is really just off base. Um, another thing of course people are concerned about is, is people leaving the city. Um, here, the sense we have is that uh, the numbers and the data don't actually um, support some of the, the more dire uh, concerns that people have. This just shows kind of net migration um, in or out of the city going back decade by decade. The difference between the blue line below, which is net migration and the population change, the dark line is essentially births. And what you see is kind of, you know, in some decades we've seen, and of course in the 70s, we saw dramatic declines in population in the city. Um, most of the others we've seen, you know, either dramatic increases or, or relatively strong increases. One thing to think about is that people leave New York City both for potentially temporary reasons and other potentially long-term forces like being priced out or household composition or economic activity and jobs and other things. And these long-term forces are not going to, are, are the ones that are less likely to change as a result of COVID um, over this year or two that we're experiencing this. And that, and, that, and that those things are going to kind of fundamentally stay the same or much more so than the temporary um, uh, changes. Of course, there's a concern that if um, uh, high income individuals leave that will have fiscal impacts. And I'll talk about that a little later. Um, uh, and often I think what we see is that in specific communities, um, a relatively small number of people, affluent people in particular, moving into a certain community can make a, a big change in that one community, but it doesn't actually have that big a change on New York City overall uh, because of the size and robustness of the city. And the other thing to kind of keep in mind is that a lot of this is being driven by a cost differential, which grew dramatically over the prior decade. And in particular, you know, from 2010 to 2020, before COVID hit, New York City added a million new jobs and saw dramatic increases in home values and home pricing, especially in the core of the re region, Kings County, Bronx County, Queens County, New York County. That's where home values and, and the price of living was going up the fastest. And in, in, in further parts of the region, especially in Connecticut, we saw very little change in that. Every time somebody relocates and moves out of the Upper West Side or out of Brooklyn into Long Island or Connecticut, that cost differential shifts a little bit. And so in, to some degree, it's a kind of self-correcting factor. Um, and we, we are already starting to see early indications that the cost differential between the city and the rest of the region has been, is starting to narrow. Um, and so again, kind of understand that there are self-correcting mechanisms within these kinds of changes. And to some degree, after a decade of such incredible job growth in the core of the region and increases in housing prices in the core of the region, a rebalancing is not such a bad thing in terms of job growth and housing and other things around the region. The things that are concerns for us, there are three real threats that we think would make the downturn uh, uh, harder and deeper and, and more difficult to recover from. The first one I talked about is a downward fiscal spiral. Um, New York City, New York State, all of the states are really concerned about their, their finances. And really this is one where federal action is necessary. I'll, I'll point out though that more so I think than any other public entity in the country perhaps, the MTA needs 
federal relief. They have been losing money at $200 million a week, again, because we are more reliant on riders to pay operating costs than any other transit agency in the country. Um, and if the MTA is forced to make short-term decisions because of this fiscal situation, that could have serious long-term effects. And so I, I think that they are doing, I, I know today they've announced increases in fares and tolls and some service cuts potentially, and they're doing everything they can to stave this off, but we all have a stake in making sure that federal relief comes, comes forward because that is probably the worst threat that would make recovery harder. Other concerns we have are that um, evictions and business failures could be worse. And in particular, we've been under these moratoriums on evictions, which is the right thing to do. But as we come out from this and start to try and transition back to a healthy economy, we're gonna need um, the public and private sector and everyone involved, small businesses and renters, landlords and building owners, banks and lenders, and the public sector, everybody's gonna have to have skin in the game and come to the table to come through a workout so that we can try to keep as many businesses in place as possible, so that we don't have um, evictions of renters and others, so that the recovery can, can get its footing and, and move forward. And that's gonna take very complicated and important public policy to do. And then finally, it's a broader perception. And those of us who remember New York in the 70s know that when there's a perception that the city is unhealthy and, and unsafe, um, that can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. And so we all need to push back up, uh, against that and make sure that people understand. I'm sure I'm not the only one who gets calls from cousins in Montana kind of wondering if the Upper West Side is a, is a deserted wasteland of you know escape from New York. And, and we have to push back against that and make sure that perception doesn't become reality. One really important thing I wanna highlight for everybody, other than wearing masks and practicing social distancing and washing our hands and things, one of the simplest, fastest, safest, most effective things we can do is to download the COVID Alert apps, COVID Alert New York and why COVID Alert NJ. Um, just by the practice of putting this app on your phone, which would automatically uh, let people know when they've been in touch with somebody who then does subsequently test positive for coronavirus. And having gone through two false alarms uh, in my own family in the last couple of months, I'm, I'm quite I take this quite personally. I just want to encourage everybody, we all have a hand in, in, in stopping the spread of this by, by improving contact tracing, by downloading these apps and participating in this really, really important process. Kind of to wind up, I'll say, I think there are five great reasons to bet on New York and the region and to be confident about the future. First is that urban density still is very much an advantage in the emerging economy. Um, even as people talk about the tech companies saying that people can re work remotely, we're also seeing those same companies um, taking large leases and betting on New York. And that's because they know that density is still an advantage. It's the best way to create a, a creative economy, to create opportunity, um, and that that is something that we have. And diversity and talent are still going to drive success in the 21st century. Also, let's just realize that the unique assets that we have here in New York and this metropolitan region cannot be replicated by other metro regions and cities around the country or world. We were so well positioned before this uh, pandemic hit, and it's not like other cities and regions will have the kind of transit commuter rail system so that they have businesses of access to the millions of, of workers and creative workers um, across a range of industries um, uh, and, and talents that we have. Those assets can't be replicated. Um, we're already seeing that businesses and households are seizing opportunities. Uh, they are seeing buying opportunities, frankly, and probably will do very well through this. And so we're gonna see some of that kind of new, new, new growth and new industries that were frankly priced out. Um, I mean, a year ago, the real problem with New York was it was too crowded and too expensive. Um, there's a temporary shift in that, and we're seeing businesses and, and people take advantage of that. 
And finally, perhaps this is a wake up call to address some of the structural problems that we really have had. And we know that we have to invest in our transit systems. We know that we have to deal with structural racism in our communities and inequities in the way we treat different communities and, and individuals and people. Um, and so hopefully this is a wake up call for that. Uh, I'll say um, we think at RPA that the fourth regional plan provides a good framework for recovery and renewal. Uh, and of course, these are kinds of issues that people have been talking about. The plan put health, equity, prosperity, and sustainability at the core of its all recommendations and talks about fixing institutions, saving and modernizing transit, designing streets for people, which has really been um, one of the benefits out of this is that we've seen how people can use streets and that we shouldn't just be turning them all over to the automobile. Um, making sure that we create affordable broadband for everyone and invest in telecommunications because of how reliant we are. So all of these are areas that we think um, are going to get real wind in their sails as we move forward. Uh, and so I'll just kind of close as, as uh, Travis mentioned, we have annual events and other ways that people can get involved. So I'd encourage folks to, to, to sign up and join in. So with that, I'll stop Travis and turn it back to you. I'm gonna turn off the, the um, sharing and, uh, and you can take it away. Great, well, Tom, thank you so much for that. I mean, that was so enlightening. Um, I learned so much, you know, I, I've heard this before, but I keep, I, every time I hear it, I just learn more and more and more. Um, and, I, you know, I just wanted to focus a little bit on, on uh, you know, federal government, um, you know, in about uh, 63 days, and I just wanna say, you know, I think a lot of what was in your presentation is encouraging news. I mean, what, what's amazing is we, we know what to do, right? We just have to do it. And, um, you know, in, in 63 days and I think 29 minutes, um, we will have a new president uh, and vice president. And, you know, I think, I think a lot of times we forget the important role the federal government plays in New York City. A lot of people tend to think that the mayor can just sort of snap his finger or the governor can snap his or her finger and make things happen. But the federal government plays such, such an important role. And I, I just was wondering if you could, you, you, you touched on a little bit in the presentation, but I was just wondering if you can dive a little deeper in what your expectations are in the Biden administration and how it relates to some of the things they've been talking about that could be helpful to New York. Sure, sure. First, I, I think I, I should preface my remarks by saying RPA is, of course, a nonpartisan organization and we don't endorse any candidates. That said, having spoken with Joe Biden directly about some of these issues in the last couple of years, um, but even before I talk about what they're going to do, I think that the first thing is, you know, going back to the concerns about misinformation. One of the things that's really hampered us in, in responding to coronavirus has been just the, the level of public distrust in information that they're getting and the chaos and confusion that's out there. I think that all of the governors um, really deserve Ned Lamont, Andrew Cuomo, and Phil Murphy and the coordination that we've seen um, up and down the Northeast and bipartisan in a way too, of course. Um, has really, they've pushed back hard against that and shown that, that strong leadership is truly critical to try and make sure that the public understands and has faith in the information that they're getting so that people will understand when you are told not to do this, it really means you have to, you have to, to stop doing that. And that means, you know, social distancing and, and wearing a mask and things like that. Because I think Sadly, this tragedy um, has been much worse than it needed to be just by the confusion and chaos that was created, frankly, out of, out of the White House uh, during this period. Um, so, so just getting back to a semblance of normalcy and having people all kind of uh, get a clear and consistent message um, that lines up with the federal, the state, and the local level will be really important and I think and I think help us all recover from this. But then looking forward to you know um, uh, 28 minutes and and whatever it was 62 <laughs> days from now, um, you know there's a lot that we can expect and and it's not just that that Joe Biden is a kind of supporter of infrastructure and has been a rider of Amtrak and all those other stories. He is probably has the the 
the most sophisticated and well thought out understanding of the importance of infrastructure of any president in my lifetime. This is a person who has been in these issues for decades, has surrounded himself with advisors and people, including, you know, we benefit here in the region. I mean, I, to say, you know, Sarah Feinberg, who runs the Transit Authority very capably and, and has really been an excellent uh, person talk about being thrust into, <laughs> into a role just weeks before COVID hit. Sarah worked also in, in the Biden Obama-Biden Obama administration, I should say. Biden has surrounded himself consistently through his career with people um, uh, really who, who understand and care about these issues. And so on things like the Gateway Project, which is probably the most important major capital investment on infrastructure, on transportation infrastructure in the entire country, um, there are things that Amtrak can do immediately and that the states can do. And in particular, um, uh, you know, a record of decision on the environmental impact statement on the tunnels has been sitting on Secretary Chow's desk for, I believe it's now over two years, wow. just waiting for her to sign it. And that project became politicized, sadly, in the current environment. We expect that to move forward. We expect to see support for these things. So even with a divided Congress and, and need for bipartisan negotiation, which should happen and, and, and is important, I think that just clear and consistent support and messaging and, and moving aside some of those issues and, and taking down the temperature, all, all of that bodes well for us. Yeah, yeah. No, those are all um, really great points. Uh, I'm starting to get a, a, a significant number of questions in the Q&A, uh -oh. uh, which is great. I mean, because because for those that don't know, many people will call friends and gossip about sports and politics and art. Tom and I will gossip about urban planning, so we can go on all day. <laughs> yes, for hours. <laughs> right. So I uh, I do want to point out that this uh, this talk is being recorded, um, and we will share that recording afterwards with all our audience. Uh, and for those who I know couldn't join, um, that was one of the big questions. Uh, I want to spend. Um, you know, there, there are so many challenges facing our country that we have to sort of hit straight on. I mean, things like climate change and economic opportunity, uh, even infrastructure. But, but the one that seems to be really top of mind these days is equity and making sure that we have inclusive growth uh, and growth that could make sure that, you know, there's so many talented people, it doesn't matter what part of the income range you are, but make sure that everybody has an opportunity to portray to participate in our economy and participate in, in, in what's going to occur over the next couple of years as we kind of get out of, of the COVID era. So, you know, yesterday or a couple of days ago, I think it was, you know, one of the things that I love about RPA is you've been very focused on this issue and, and on equity. But, but the other day you uh, announced in partnership with the New York City Employment and Training Coalition and the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development the NYC Inclusive Growth Initiative, which I think is just so smart um, and so thoughtful and so important. And we're getting a lot of questions about how RPA uh, has been dealing with the issues of equity and inclusion. And I just was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that initiative and generally speaking, how RPA is approaching these issues. Sure, thanks for, thanks for bringing that up. And, and we are really excited to be undertaking this, this initiative in partnership with ANHD and, and the Employment and Training Coalition and Joey Ortiz and, and Barika Williams and the leadership that they provide. I, I think that everybody understands that, um, that the process for kind of planning and, and rezoning the Euler process and the City Planning Council and Commission um, and you know in New York, isn't working for anybody right now. Communities feel left out of the important discussions mm -hmm. and conversations that are happening and feel like they are reacting to decisions that are being made without them in the room. Businesses are worried about the ability to grow and expand and provide um, prosperity and more jobs. And so we're getting kind of the worst of all possible worlds right now. Um, this is not going to be easy. There's no silver bullet to this. And, and often we look at these issues. And one of the things also at RPA is understanding that these are complex problems that don't have one single uh, you know, remedy or anything, but instead 
are going to require um, looking at the whole issue and understanding it and compromise and consensus building and really trying to come up with, with, with new ways to do it. But what we want to do through this inclusive growth initiative, inclusive growth initiative, is see if we can put both those community concerns front and center, but also find a way to move forward on, on, on projects and kind of planning so that we are, so that New York continues to, to be um, an engine for prosperity and growth and, and, um, and opportunity. Uh, and, and so that's kind of the, the, the undertaking. And I'll say that I, I'd encourage folks to go to the website and, and look at this because we are enlisting folks to join us in this effort and, and it's not something we're gonna do. I'll say we come at this at RPA with the same kind of checkered history that everybody in, in our field does. Um, we've been around since for a hundred years at Regional Plan Association, and we've done some wonderful things over those decades. And I'm very proud of the work in the 60s and early 70s. RPA was at the forefront of advocacy planning and community advocacy and really talking right. about um, uh, the perils of segregation and other things. But we were also in the 40s and 50s, an organization that was helping communities create land use plans and zoning laws that were embedding segregation and racism, frankly, in, in a lot of communities. And what we know now is that the segregated landscape that we have was not something that just came about of its own, but was often aided and embedded and really guided by public policy intentionally. And I think those of us in, in my profession have a special responsibility to try and make up for that. Because really historically at a time that our nation was making uh, housing affordable and putting it within the reach and it, was a, and it was a vehicle to bring many people into the middle class, we were excluding um, African-Americans and, and others from that opportunity. And so we have to, we have to right that wrong. Um, and make sure that going forward, we are creating uh, more opportunity and really addressing, addressing those issues. So the Inclusive Growth Initiative is one of the ways that we're trying to do that, but also recognizing um, that, um, that promoting mass transit, that promoting job growth, uh, educational opportunity and other things is a way we, we kind of make sure that, um, uh, that we are trying to, to try and correct those those mistakes from the past. Yeah, well, it's great. I mean, I think it's wonderful that uh, you know we, we can always take a take a look back and understand the mistakes that we made and learn from them. I want to spend a second on on planning, if that's okay, because one of the things that occurred to me um, in the COVID experience was it felt like we were really unprepared uh, for it. And it, you know, I mean, how many of us have seen movies about pandemics and things like that? So, so it's not a, it wasn't a shock that we would actually have a pandemic. But you know, when you look, for example, at the fact that it seems, you know, one in three hundred Americans are New York City public school students. And that's just an incredible fact. And uh, three of those happen to be my kids. Um, and you know, it, it seems like every day we are coming up with some new way to sort of educate our kids in this tough time. And I really hope that one of the lessons learned from all this is the importance of planning um, and listening to planning. I mean, I think that a lot of planning has gotten done. And I was at a, the Obama Foundation Summit last year and, and President Obama talked about, you know, we know what to do on a lot of these issues. It's, it's the fact that we're not listening um, and following through on it. So, you know, I, just getting back to, we're, we're going to have another COVID or some other event, a Sandy, a Dylan. What, what, what can we be doing more as an audience? People care about our city to sort of prepare ourselves for the next event. Yeah, and, and you know, and in just the last twenty years, those of us we've seen a, a terrorist attack, a financial crisis, um, uh, a storm probably, you know, stronger and, and, and worse because of climate change, um, and now a public health crisis. Um, you know, there are a lot of different things. Planners, for, for, 
for much of my career, the, the, the feeling of planning was to try and figure out how to make everything as efficient and effective as possible. And to some degree, we were trying to kind of get blood from a stone. I mean, it was a kind of, how can you squeeze out every little bit of capacity you can out of a housing market, out of a transportation system, out of your the investments you've made in um, water or energy or telecom. Now I think we understand that resilience and redundancy are positive things. And they, that was what we were planning against before. And now what we're starting to understand is that we, we, we really need to have um, uh, um, you know, mechanisms in place to allow us to, to continue through whether, when these disruptions happen. Um, the, the, the economic geography, I mean, after 9-11, industries moved over to Jersey City. Well, thank God there was capacity there for those businesses right. to keep their operations in this region so that they didn't move them to other parts of the country or, or go under and not have opportunities to do that. Um, you know, our transportation system has been stressed several times through these kinds of activities. We've seen that we can provide, whether it's ferries providing a new way to get across the Hudson River or bus system flexing up um, when, when we don't have uh, uh, rail options or other things. And of course, you know, in, in, in this most recent um, uh, with COVID, you know, people getting out on the streets and biking. Um, which right. even as transit ridership um, dropped very precipitously, we saw more people biking. And so that's, that's the kind of um, new planning uh, thinking that we're doing, which is making sure that we have resiliency and redundancy in this, these systems. The other thing I'd say is we were unprepared for this, but we were starting to recognize, and I think planners and public health officials in particular, have started to recognize the really important linkages between what they do. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, and I'll, I'll give a shout out to two um, philanthropies, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and Bloomberg Philanthropies that have been at the, yeah. the front edge of, of doing this. And understanding that public health, I mean, we're all focused on a vaccine right now. And, and of course the delivery of, of, of public health um, through those mechanisms is vitally important. But when COVID is over, the greatest determinant of somebody's, of an individual's public health, of the, of the quality of life and the length of life that they will live is the community they live in. And whether it's a community that has clean air and water and whether it promotes an active lifestyle so that they can walk and get around without having to be stuck in a car all the time, whether they have um, uh, adequate and safe uh, housing, those are <laughs> The greatest determinants, the vast majority of, of factors that determine um, uh, public health are actually the physical planning issues around a community rather than access to a doctor or medicine. Um, hmm. And so we've, the, the public health industry has, has been recognizing this and moving in this direction. And COVID hit right at the time, you know, when when we were we were kind of working and redoubling those efforts. And I expect that to be something that continues post COVID. Um, and again, some of the work that's been done, the coordination between the states has been really critical because of course COVID doesn't care what side of a municipal or state boundary you're on and it's going to right. spread. Right. The points. Um, I want to turn to some of the audience questions. We have we have, geez, almost thirty now. Oh wow! Uh, so 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 Tom, I don't know what you're doing for dinner. Uh, if you want to stick around, um, <laughs> I'm here. Uh, you know, a number of questions are coming in regarding uh, retail and the mm -hmm. fact that uh, COVID is so. Even before COVID, I would say, you know, retail was really struggling. Yeah. Um, and you know, the fact that our storefronts mean so much to the livability of our communities. Um, I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about your, your thinking about that, how that comes back. And also, if you don't mind, I, I think another big issue that, that has come out and I keep seeing is, is the issue of open space. And now that we're using streets, um, you know, we've created these amazing public plazas around the city. You know, what can we be doing to, to, to first just save the storefronts and save the, 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 you know, the restaurants and all the things that mean so yeah. much to our communities? And, and and kind of better activate our um, our public open space because it's such a yeah. it's such a magnet both for communities and tourists. Yeah, 
Um, great questions and tough issues, especially the retail. I mean, as you said, we were already seeing a changing dynamic. Uh, E-commerce has, has been growing rapidly for years. It's <coughs> exploded um, during COVID. And, and, and it's not necessarily, this is one of these trends that I don't think is gonna suddenly go reverse itself. We're not gonna put the, the, the genie back in the bottle um, on this. On the other hand, local retail, local shops, I think everybody is suddenly recognizing just how important it is to having a vibrant, healthy community to have that as part of the community, that, that street level retail, and restaurants and the industry. It's of course important, we all have friends. My brother-in-law is a restaurateur, so I'm right. acutely aware of this. Um, uh, we all know that that industry is incredibly important to so many people and their livelihoods, and it's part of what makes a sec successful community and a place that we wanna live in and a place that we wanna be part of. And it's how we come together as people is through that that serendipity and 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 having that, um, you know, my own sense is, and again, we have and we actually have a panel this afternoon, a, a virtual panel at RPA. We're going to have on this, and and I know I guess that you can't stay for dinner. Sorry, yeah, so I can't stay I guess... for dinner. But 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 what this is going to require. So again, this is one of these issues that even pre-COVID, we were heading for a reckoning where there was gonna to have to be some recalibration about the underlying finances of in real estate and retail and how we, how we did right. this. Um, and then this of course has kind of forced everything, first everything to shut down. And now as we reopen, um, figuring out what we can do to try and make sure that retail uh, and street level retail and, and community is still part of the equation and part of our communities is going to be vital. Now, this is actually connected with the open space question because one of the things we've also discovered is that public spaces, you know, it used to be, I would testify at hearings and you would talk about like creating public spaces and people would say, well, we don't want a restaurant or businesses going in there because this is supposed to be public and that would be private. And they would have these concerns about it. And I used to think, yeah, I, I get those concerns and you certainly want this to be democratic space. But part of the reason a restaurant might move in is because people want to use it. I mean, people, you know, that 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 it's that it's it's an activity that attracts us. Um, and so we've seen now through open streets how much people, and this is not just in New York, by the way, but across the region and the nation, that people are enjoying outdoor dining, that they're enjoying having streets freed up as space that they can where children can play, where they can bike, where they can walk yeah. around and stuff instead of just, you know, and we had really turned over too much of, of this of this landscape and this, especially the, the space between the curbs, two cars. New York had been a leader thanks to Jeanette Sadek Khan first as the DOT commissioner and then continued by Polly Trottenberg um, to, to be a national leader in doing this. And we've seen other, you know, even Los Angeles and places have been moving in this direction but we've seen this expand. So I think that part of the future of retail is gonna to be to kind of rethink the geography, rethink the relationship between the private and the public space and be more creative about that. It's flexibility. We created planning structures that were very, very rigid and that's not the way communities work. And so more fluidity in this is gonna be important. Um, and that's important to try and support and help retail come back. I also think that there's going to have to be some new financial relationships between landlords and the retail. And maybe, um, you know, maybe rather than a flat rent, it's going to be a percentage of sales or other things. Because buildings and communities need to have that, that activation at the ground floor. Right. And, you know, and, and ironically, what's happening is we're seeing retail suffer just as people want to come back to community and interact more than ever. And, and I hope that next year we're going we're gonna to start to see this really flourish. Yeah, yeah. Very important. Um, I think we might have time for one or two more questions. Um, okay. One question I, I, I keep getting is about affordable housing. And uh, an interesting question came about. Uh, and I'll just read it to you, Tom, because I think it's a fascinating sure. question. 
Um, our record of incentivizing the private sector to provide affordable housing has been spotty and inadequate to the need. NYCHA's problem is notwithstanding, does government need to get back into the business of building housing? Uh, if not, how can the private sector be better enabled to do a better job in this very expensive market? Yeah, that's a great, great question. First, I, I will say, when we talk about infrastructure and community and other things in New York, NYCHA should be at the, at the top of our minds. And it's another area where the federal government historically has had a commitment to, to um, funding and especially capital and maintaining public housing. And it is, um, I think, shamefully stepped away from that. And so in conversations um, next year about federal funding and other things, NYCHA, we all have a stake in having um in getting funding to 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 repair and rebuild uh, and maintain uh nycha's uh public housing because that's absolutely critical but i think that the the questioner points to a good thing which is in some ways we've already ceded too much ground even with that we're just talking about trying to hold on to what we've got and right. it's almost as if it's <laughs> off the table the concept of 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 expanding our public housing supply Broadly speaking, you know, too often the debate about affordable housing is one of kind of regulation or new production. And right. anybody who's looked at the whole issue will tell you, you're going to need all of it. You cannot, there's no one single um, uh, solution to it. And you're going to need both for in, uh, continued production of housing, both affordable and frankly market rate too, because it is, of course, uh, a continuum. And in New York City and in the entire region, because uh, um, Carl Weisbrod, the former chair of the City Planning Commission, who created a mm -hmm. Department of Regional Planning in, in City Planning very wisely, yeah. uh, I think Carl, um, you know, appropriately said New York City cannot handle, cannot deal with its, its you know, uh, housing crisis within the five boroughs itself. It's a regional housing market. It's a regional um, workforce and employment market. And so we need all of the, the communities to be um, to be playing a role in this. Um, I think so. So I think kind of the questioner is is pointing out we should be talking about expanding public housing again. We shouldn't be relying solely on the private sector to provide it. We need to do things to um, protect renters and and protect um, low income communities and essentially ones that are facing um, uh, gentrification and change need to have um, uh, policies in place to protect people, mm -hmm. but we also need to keep producing more housing, affordable housing and even market rate housing in many communities. I, I think our goal is to try and make sure that we maintain diversity in communities across the region. Um, Cause it's not good, a, a homogenous community um, on either end of the economic spectrum is not really a healthy thing overall. Um, right. We need to have workforce housing um, and opportunities for people for, for, for at all levels of the economy to, to participate in this region. Yeah, yeah, very good point. One last question um, before we let you go. I know we can go on all day. I, I just wanted to touch These upon- are uh, <laughs> They are, they're good. I mean, we have a pretty impressive audience. Um, uh, green jobs. Um, you know, I think one of the, uh, you know, statistically speaking, you know, one of the areas that could really help boost our economy and at the same time, frankly, deal with the very serious issues of climate change is yeah. the green jobs plan. Um, there's been a lot thrown out. And, you know, can you just talk a little bit about what a sort of successful green recovery looks like? Um, that gets, you know, people into jobs, you know, the connection to job training. Um, sure. You know, how, do you, how do you feel about that? What is RPA looking at? Well, well, to take it from a broad, I mean, first of all, obviously we need to be scaling up and investing in renewables um, mm -hmm. and, and, and cleaning and greening our energy supply and, 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 and moving in that direction. And the economy has been moving that, in that direction, <laughs> despite, frankly, federal policy for the last three years and 11 or 10 months. Um, 
and what we need is federal support to keep going in that direction. One of the right. big picture things that I don't think people are aware of is, is actually the Eastern seaboard and what's called the New York Bight, where we kind of, we cut up through New Jersey and then jut out on Long Island and towards New England, creates one of the world's most perfect environments for offshore wind in particular. And so offshore wind, it's not just like an opportunity for us. We are, you know, as friends in the industry will say to me, we are the Saudi Arabia of offshore wind with the shallow shelf on, in, in the Atlantic, the enormous need and demand, um, you know, onshore, but, but close to shore, and the opportunity essentially to harness the wind that's kind of blowing up the, the, the Atlantic seaboard. Um, that's just one industry that I am hopeful we will start to see more federal support um, for offshore leases. Um, we will see more investment in the industry. We will see regulatory um, processes move forward so that we can become um, the, one of the leading regions in the world in terms of offshore wind and renewables. Solar, of course, especially on our industrial buildings and other opportunities, there are things to do there. And we all know, and again, this is one where President-elect Biden Biden, I think, has spoken very eloquently about the economic opportunities that it presents and how much it can do. Now, making sure there is a connect, and in some ways, I would say a disconnect between kind of these big picture issues and the local zoning and planning that we have. Um, and so making sure it's through the work I do with the New Jersey State Planning Commission, making sure that, you know, zoning codes predate any of this, and they don't really have any, any effective mechanism for thinking about and, and encouraging and expediting this transformation that's underway and so important to our success. And so I'm very hopeful and optimistic that we're gonna to start to see creativity in this because we need to be converting our you know, transportation system. We need to electrify our transportation yep. system. We need to electrify our buildings. Um, New York has, of course, with local law 97, been out front on that. There are, I think, some substantial fixes that need to be made to some of that legislation. And hopefully this is an area where we're gonna see um, a lot of capital invested, a lot of um, opportunity, a lot of employment, and, and be able to start to really support and, and grow in a positive way. Great, great, great. So Tom, unfortunately we've come up to the end of our hour. Um, you know, over the last hour, we've, we, we've talked about infrastructure, transportation, the environment, housing, workforce development, uh, healthcare, uh, racial uh, disparities, um, all issues that are just so critical to the future of, of New York and uh, so important. And just, you know, for me, gives me such optimism about the future of our region. And uh, I just wanna thank you and the Regional Plan Association for everything you're doing. Um, you are making our lives better um, you're preparing us for the future, uh, and I couldn't really thank you enough. Um, I do want to just mention once again, uh, just to plug RPA, to go, as Tom mentioned, to go on the website, um, become a member, uh, sign up for the newsletter. The more people involved in the planning of our region, uh, of New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, the better, the better ideas we get, the better thoughtfulness we get, the more commitment we get, um, we can make this place uh, so much more livable and enjoyable. Um, I hope everybody in the audience learned a lot. I know I did. Um, you know, I, I apologize that we couldn't get to every question. Uh, maybe we'll do it again sometime soon. Uh, I'd be happy Tom, to um, you know, just thank you again. Thank you again for, for your time and for everything Thanks. else. And if you have any final, final thoughts, final comments. I'll just thank you, Travis and Capolino for setting this up and really everybody who's, who's participated and listened because it's not, you know, RPA, we're only, we are very fortunate to work in uh, a city and region that has such wonderful civic engagement, and so many people who are so actively involved. And, and that's what makes us successful. It's, it's all of our efforts. Great. I couldn't agree more. On behalf of the Capolino team, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, look for um, uh, more uh, Future of New York series coming up. We'll have some announcements pretty soon. Tom, once again, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Travis.